Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to tonight's education on the budget, tax implications, and JobKeeper Explained, presented by PKF Newcastle. So my name is Charles Broadfoot. I'm a professional development officer with the Primary Health Network. I'd firstly like to acknowledge the First Peoples and traditional custodians of the lands in which we're meeting tonight, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Tonight we will be using Slido uh, for both the questions and the evaluation poll at the end. Um, you'll see these on the right hand side of your screen. Um, alternatively, you can go to slido.com and enter the event code BTJ. Um, there'll also be a QR code that'll pop up on your screen throughout tonight. So you can scan that on your mobile device and um, that will take you to the questions pane as well. Um, so we're definitely encouraging questions tonight. I'm sure, you'll, I'm sure you will have many of those. So you can ask these throughout. Um, our speakers will address them as they come up and as relevant to the content. So tonight's session is being recorded um, and the recording and the slides will be available um, on our PHN People Bank page from next week. So the PHN recognises the ongoing hardship that COVID-19 has brought to small and medium-sized businesses in primary care. The recent budget announcements, the tax implications associated with these, and the impact of JobKeeper on the staff retention and recruitment are all major challenges being faced. In tonight's session, we are hoping to address these through the facilitation and presentation by our financial partners, PKF. PKF have been very generous giving their time tonight and also previously to deliver this session at no cost. Uh, we thank them for the ongoing support to primary care. So I'd like to introduce tonight's speakers. So we have Greg Cox, who's a partner here at PKF Newcastle. Greg is a chartered accountant and chartered tax advisor with over 20 years of taxation and business advisory experience. Greg provides taxation and business advisory services to a broad range of small and medium sized businesses with a particular focus uh, on a few key industries, including health, pharmacy and hospitality. We also have Darren Schoen. He is a PKF tax partner here in Newcastle. Darren is part of a specialist taxation team um, and with more than 30 years of experience in public practice accounting, Darren has dedicated the last 16 years of his career to full-time taxation advisory. Uh, this specialisation has seen him develop ex extensive knowledge across GST, capital gains tax, income tax, and New South Wales state taxes. So I'd like to welcome Darren up to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, with, with your questions, please feel free to um, send them through during the presentation, but there will also be some time to cover them at the end. So the um, two topics I'm going to cover generally, you can see there, is just a bit about the federal budget. I'm not going to cover absolutely everything in the budget, just what I think is most relevant. And then we're going to cover the, the changes to JobKeeper, given we're in the extension period now, and we've got another extension period about some of the changes there uh, and how, how they're different to what we had before and what we've got to look out for moving forward. In terms of the budget, I'm going to cover these six main areas. Um, the first one is the personal tax cuts that have been announced that affect pretty much everyone. Uh, the next bit is the, some expanded concessions for small business entities, which we'll cover. A lot of these are driven on turnover tests which they've expanded um, so they're not necessarily changes but some of them are some tweaks. The biggest one that they announced was the instant asset write-off and the changes and we've already had an instant asset write-off and now we've got this new immediate expensing provision so I'll run through that. Can be a little bit confusing but there is some some important considerations there, some important time frames to be aware of. If somebody operates through a company, they've reintroduced a thing called a loss carryback. We'll explain a bit about that. It's only relevant for companies, but we will touch on how that works and how we can tie that into the instant asset write-off provision. Um, we'll talk about the job maker hiring credit because the budget wasn't all about just giving uh, tax tax driven measures like tax cuts and tax write-offs. It's about providing some money where you hire people on top of the other stuff that they announced. And we'll talk about some other, other minor things that are not really business related, but might 
have some benefits for some personal situations with the granny flat exemption. And then we'll talk about some FBT changes for employees if they've got to be retrained into something else. First change was the personal tax rates. Now, so they brought them forward. These were already announced. These are already legislated. So they just brought them forward by two years. The 19% bracket, they've increased the upper threshold for that to 45,000. So it just means more dollars out of everyone that earns less than $45,000 are taxed at 19% instead of 32.5%, which was the next bracket. So most people get a tax cut just on that. The next threshold, where it used to cut, uh, we used to cut out at $90,000 for 32 and a half to go to about 37, doesn't cut into um, 120,000 now. So people in that bracket are saving that percentage on that range of income as well, which gives a bigger tax cut. There's a couple of offsets that people can claim and they've increased and they help bring down the tax that people are paying. Um, but it only applies to people with certain bands of income. So they're really targeted to the um, low income tax offset, which is the LITO, and the low to middle income tax offset, which is the other one there, which is the 1080. There are other tax cuts that they announced in the budget, and they didn't change those, they just reaffirmed that they start on 1 July 2024, and we dropped the 32.5% bracket to 30%, the 37% bracket is removed, and the highest rate bracket increases, doesn't kick in until we get to 200,000. Now, what those things mean in dollars is that this is for individuals. Couples can be basically double. If you earn between 45 and $90,000, it's an extra 1,080 in your pocket. And if you earn more than 120, it's two and a half grand. So it's five grand a couple who are both earning above that. I put that up in a table form so that you can see it. So you can see the red bits are the bits that are changing. So the, you can see where we've come from in June 18, on the left, all in black, and the threshold, low threshold was 18,200. That doesn't change, right? Above that, it goes to 19%. Then uh, the next bracket is the 32.5, but you can see from 1 July 2024, it drops to 30%. Now, it would have been nice if they had had the rates at 20, 30 and 45 because that would be pretty easy to remember. But you can see that's where we're proposing to end up in 2024. We'll have 19, 30 and 45% brackets and that's it. We won't have all these 32.5 and 37% brackets in the middle, which I think will make it a bit easier for people to work out what their, their tax rate is, their marginal rate, because they're pretty clearly defined brackets and they'll know exactly where they sit. So, and for a lot of people, it's going to be a 30% bracket. So the majority, by far the majority of Australians don't earn above 200000 so they'll just have 30% top rate, which is, which is a company rate, but it's a little bit higher than a small company rate. So, Darren, just um, in terms of our advice to clients at the moment um, and the flow on to how they're paying their employees, um, we're suggesting that if they're using a payroll software of some sort that they go into those and just check that those rates have been updated um, just to make sure that they are passing on those savings because as I understand it we've got until I think it's the 16th of November to be fully compliant with the new withholding regime. Yeah, so the, the rate changes actually applied in the budget from 1 July but because we've already been earning wages and paying tax instalments, those amounts have already been factored in on the old rates. And so rather than try and compensate that over the rest of the year, they simply said, what we've received, we've received. Going forward, it's on the new rates. So everyone that's employing should be updating their software and checking that they're on the newest rates because they've, they're already applying. Um, the balance of the tax that was uh, overpaid pretty much from July to September, that'll be an extra tax refund at the end of the year when you lodge your return. So you're not accessing that at the moment, but going forward, yes. So tax instalments for those paying through the pay-as-you-go withholding system should be lower to reflect the rates. 
and people who are earning wages and tax deducted should see an increase in their after tax pay. Uh, and if they don't see that, they should question that to make sure that their employer is doing it. And yes, 16th of November to get it um, done. Um, new rates you can get from the ATO site or your software needs to be updated or just make sure that your um, payroll provider is doing it, but I'm pretty sure the payroll providers will be all over it. Yes. Okay, so that's the tax rate. So if anyone has had any questions on the tax rates, please send them through. Now, um, small business changes. These aren't new changes. These are just changes that now apply to a different uh, level of turnover. So uh, I'm going to talk about turnovers and turnovers now how they're defining what taxpayers get concessions and what don't and they've been ramping up what they are. Some of the concessions I'm going to talk about tonight apply up to five billion dollars turnover. I wish I had five billion dollars worth of turnover um, but it's a pretty big number and and you know, we, start, we originally started with small business concessions. A small business was somebody with a turnover of less than $2 million. And I wish I had $2 million in turnover as well. Then they've gone to $10 million, and now they've gone to 50. So a small business is 50. Um, so, they, the peop, so the people who are under 10 already had access to these concessions. The people who were 10, 10 and 50 didn't. The people up to 50 now do have it, and it's important to note the start dates. Um, most of them won't really become relevant until you do your tax returns for the year end of June 21, but just note the start dates. So there's always been a deduction for startup expenses. Large businesses, over 10 million, used to have to write them off over five years. Now you can write them off when your turnover's up to 50 million straight away. Um, Prepayments. So if you pay for something like insurance that's going to apply to next year, if your turnover was above $10 million, you couldn't claim it even though you paid for it in June. You had to spread it out over the next 12 months. Now they can just get that deduction and they don't have to worry about it and various rules like that. Uh, small employers with turnover less than $10 million could get a car parking exemption for FBT. Those up to 50 can get it now. But note, that one doesn't apply to 1 April 20. One, and the other first two I mentioned already apply from 1 July 20. Um, small employers can give their employees, they used to be only, only able to give them an iPad or a phone. They couldn't give them both. They can now give them both and there won't be any FBT on it. The second one before would have had FBT on it. Simplified trading stock rules, they don't have to account for small variations in stock. Um, there was instalments concessions. Again, these are all in the future, so they'll be fleshed out a bit later. Um, and the other next few don't uh, really matter too much, seven and eight. Nine is a really interesting one, that there's only a two-year amendment period. So that means that the tax office can only review uh, what you've lodged for two years after it's lodged. Now, it is a bit of a double-edged sword, isn't it, Greg? So if you've only got two years to amend, then um, for you, the, the tax officer, sorry, can only amend for two years, so can you. So you're limited by the same period. So if three or four years down the track, you suddenly find that you should have claimed a deduction or you're entitled to something, you'll be out of time to amend as well. So, so just on that, an example, Darren, would be um, if you've got a, a negatively geared rental property, um, this is a, an actual client situation we've, we've had, um, and they've realised that they're only claiming interest on one of the loans and they might have had a split loan where they've got a fixed percentage and they've got a variable percentage or variable component to that loan. Um, if they haven't claimed both lots of interest, they may want to go back and claim the deduction for those. Unfortunately, and, and with the double-edged sword approach, um, you are limited, so you can't go back. And if it is three years ago, um, unfortunately, it's bad luck you won't be able to claim that deduction. That's right. There are some things that don't have time periods, but the majority of income tax returns will be limited to that period. Um, there was just on item number six there, the POYG instalments. This is a question what we get a lot at the moment is um, people that are paying their quarterly POYG instalments. Um, they're based on your, I guess, your notional tax or the, the tax that you've 
been assessed at in a previous year adjusted for um, the GDP. Um, under the ATO's COVID measures, we're in a period at the moment where you can actually choose to vary those down um, to nil or to, I guess, to adequately reflect what you believe your end tax is going to be. Historically, if you did that and you got it wrong, you'd be up for interest and penalties by the ATO. Okay, so it was a bit of a deterrent not to vary your PAYG instalments. Whereas under the COVID measures, we're now in a period where the ATO have said, we won't, in, we won't impose interest and we won't impose penalties, provided your estimate is actually roughly in line with what it's gonna come in at the end of the year. So in other words, you don't just vary all your instalments to nil, but you sort of have a reasonable estimate that perhaps your income's gonna go down, therefore your tax is gonna go down. And if you do get it wrong, you actually won't be penalised. And that applies to 30 June, 2021. So we've got a bit of a period there where we can, I guess, help cash flow by reducing your pay-as-you-go instalments. And some of the other COVID measures related to taking a tax holiday and deferring payments, but deferrals are not waivers and you eventually have to pay the tax. So um, we urge our clients when they can pay their taxes to still pay them or adequately provide for them because they don't want to fall off a cliff when JobKeeper starts running out and they suddenly got tax bills and new tax bills and everything hit them at once and business may have not recovered. So just be wary about deferring your taxes too much uh, and keeping some momentum up. Right, so as I mentioned before, that they've based a lot of these new measures, it's the new way they do it on turnover. So we now have a common $50 million aggregated turnover threshold and that applies across a number of measures that are in place. So we've got a different tax rate for companies if they turn over less than $50 million, they can have a lower tax rate. So it's consistent with that now, whereas before we had $10 million for some measures, $50 million for other, $500 million for others. Um, so it was a bit all over the place. So they're trying to make this small business now more consistent around 50. So the cash flow boost um, was $50 million, And the instant asset write-off that used to be there was $30,000, and that's now for $50 million turnover. Now, what they've brought in is a, is a test across all of JobKeeper and, and with the cash flow boost and now all these measures, aggregated turnover. So when you're, a, when you're a group of businesses that are commonly controlled, you can't just split your company into 10 and say, well, each one of them has got a notional amount of turnover. If there's 10 of them and they're all at $20 million, your turnover is $200 million. You're not going to get around it by splitting, and that's what they're trying to do. Pretty technical terms to be uh, affiliates and connected entities, so you just got to really carefully assess your eligibility. But we have seen a number of people fall foul of the rules. Um, common sense would say it's a 50% control test that they're applying. It's not. It's actually a 40% control test. When you control 40, you control an entity. Right, unless somebody else has got more than you, in which case they control it. But a lot of people get caught out with the 40% um, test in terms of that aggregation. And they're bright line tests, which means that if you go a dollar over the 50 million, you don't get any of the concessions. A dollar under, you can have the concessions. And they're usually 50 million or less. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, the, the most important concession they announced in the budget was the instant asset write-off. So this one's a little bit confusing because we've had a number of measures that they've changed over time. So unfortunately, the slide is a little bit busy, but it gets really simple with the latest measure that they announced in the budget, which is the bottom of that table, which I'll cover. Now, this one, um, the initial one, was small business entities for less than $10 million. And from May 15 to 31 December 20, they had differing asset thresholds depending on when they acquired the assets. So these measures are all still there, they haven't been replaced. So initially from May 15 to January 19, it was a $20,000 threshold that you could write off. From January 19 to April 19, it went to 25. 
But then suddenly they went from April 19 to March 20. They went to 30. And then in March 20, when COVID hit, and it was only supposed to run to December 20, right, that was $150,000. Now that's all assets, new or second hand, as long as your turnover was less than $10 million. From 1 January 21, that's going back to 1,000. Now there's lots of calls for that to stay at these high levels and effectively make the tax. And all of these measures have made tax returns more cash flow rather than the way they used to do it with income and expenses. And now they came out over time, they're simply saying, what money did you get in? What money did you spend? That's your taxable income. And these asset write-offs help you do that. Then they announced measures in April 19 for 10, the 10 to $50 million, and they could get the $30,000 write-off and then they get the $150,000 write-off. Then, in April 19 to December 20, they announced that the up to $500 million could get the $150,000 write-off, and if they didn't get the $150,000 write-off because something cost two hundred, dollars they could write off half of it and then depreciate the rest of it over the rest of its life. So, as I said, all of those rules are still there, and you'll see in the tables they've now gone to 30 June 21. So they've extended all of those rules left them there and then they announced this less than $5 billion turnover from 7.30pm on 6 October, budget night, that if it's acquired and installed by 30 June 2022, you could write off assets of any value, not limited to $150,000. You could buy assets and you can improve existing assets. Catch for people over the 50 million is that it can only be new assets or improve an old asset. So basically a big improvement to an old asset. But for the people under $50 million, they get to write off um, new and secondhand assets 100%. So you can see that that one basically overrides everything else. Its dates extend beyond the other ones, right? And it is an immediate expensive with no cap. But they've left them there because some people will still fall out of the rules for some reason or another. So the rules are still relevant for those periods, but they're effectively overridden there. Now, there are some tricks with it as well. So not all assets are created equal, and the law still has some limits in there for certain assets that you can't claim this for. So there are a couple of provisions that you can't claim it for, and cars so you see about the fourth point down there that you can't go out and buy a $200,000 Maserati and write it off because it's a car it's subject to this car limit you'd only get the write off on that $59,000 amount that's sitting there okay now it's $5 billion I don't have any clients that turn over $5 billion okay so it's a, it's a number that's when you write it down it just doesn't look real with the number of zeros you've got to write down Okay, but if they're above five billion, good luck to them. They don't get to write off their assets instantly. No, boo hoo. Um, full expensive for secondhand assets, less than fifty million dollars. So that's okay. Remember, no cap anymore. Important thing is you've got to have cash flow to do it. So don't go out and spend it if you haven't got it. It's great to get a tax deduction, but you're not paying any tax if you've lost money and you might not have a house anymore. It's aggregated turnover again. Common theme, common turnover thresholds now, common concept, aggregated turnover. You've got to bring everyone that you control together to determine what to qualify for. Car limit applies. Applies to cars, not things that are not cars, and there's some definitions on what cars are. But generally, everything you drive around with seats and carries passengers and is designed and, and marketed that way is a car. Um, it doesn't include buildings, so you can't buy a building and write it off. And there are two particular provisions. One's about primary production, um, and there's another one there about other deductions that you're getting that are special that you can't apply it for. But the majority of things you buy that are photocopiers and, and um, big mining machinery and stuff like that, yeah, they'll all qualify. Um, cameras, computers, all of those things. Um, now, the, I'll just, um, yep. just jump in a, and, and talk about the conversation we had the other day, and I just want to clarify a few points here. Um, the first is that the, the instant asset write-off, the plant and equipment still needs to be business-related or used in the business. Yeah. So you can't just go out and buy 
a piece of equipment, for example, for your home. It's got to be used in the business in order to get the instant asset write-off in the same way that you could only depreciate an asset that was used in the business. So that's the first point. Um, the second one is by bringing forward the tax deduction under this instant asset write-off, all of a sudden you no longer have essentially a cost or a cost base to this plant and equipment. So if you do go and sell that particular piece of equipment, you may well be bringing forward a taxable, I guess, a taxable event where you may have to pay tax on it because it no longer has a cost base. Um, and that's probably one of the, the key things here. You, 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 you potentially could um, get an instant deduction for the asset, but that if you're planning to sell it in two years time, you may well have a tax event at that particular point in time. Will wipe out your tax costs. You will have nothing left. So you will have income as soon as you sell it, which um, which is great. You'll have the cash, but you'll have a tax bill of thirty percent, say, on that sale. The other important thing to note um, are the dates. It's not just enough to buy an asset to write it off. It has to be installed and ready for use. So I've gone back to that table, and you can see the third column across says first installed and ready for use. So you've got you've got an acquisition date in the second column, and then you've got to have it installed. Most stuff you buy, like a printout, you bring it back to the office and you plug it in straight away and it's right. But there might be some bigger bits of machinery that you might order, pay for, have it delivered, but there might have to be someone that comes from overseas who's got to install it because it's a specific piece of machinery, and it's not until that piece of machinery is actually operational that you can start to claim depreciation or claim this instant asset write-off so that's important around 30 june or end of financial year considerations that it's in when it's installed and ready for use people aren't good at tracking that but you've got your dates to buy it and then you've got your dates to have it ready for use so even if you buy it on 6th of october 2020 or the 7th of October, but it's not installed and ready for use by 30 June 2022, you won't get the instant asset right off. And if you claim it and they review it, they will knock it back. So it's important to, to realise that there are the two possessions. So there's turnover, quiet, first use, and thresholds that we've got to consider. But it is very handy. Um, and I know a lot of our clients have been using it because there's been stuff they've been putting off and they thought, well, now's as good as time as any. And the whole COVID thing, and we we're having this chat before, has made them think differently about how they're doing business. So people are working from home now. And if you watch all of the shows, I was watching The Block, even though I don't watch it all the time, and they're saying, you can't sell a home without a home office these days. And I don't think I heard that before March. Um, so they've all got to have home offices. So people are now... Um, our, well, PKF provides us all with the facilities that we can work from home because when we're working from home, they want us connected really easily. They want us on fast computers and they want everything to work, so they want the IT to work. My brother works for a large electricity um, supplier up, up on the north coast and they have capacity to have two or 300 people working from home. They've now got to have thousands of people working from home, so they had to rapidly expand all of their infrastructure to allow for that. The instant asset write-off will help them buy that and set up that infrastructure so that ongoing people can do that. Um, okay. The other measure um, that is important, but it's only important for companies, is the loss carryback measure. Now this one's a rehash of something that was in a few years ago that they've gone thrown out. Um, and that's just the timetable of how it works, which summarises the time period. Um, so it goes back to the year end of June 19. So that's why they've got 30 June 18 on the slide. So it goes back from 1 July 18 to 30 June 19. And then, so any tax profits up to June 21, if you make a loss after June 19, you can carry it back to that earlier year. It simply means that, that if you have a loss followed by a profit, um, a, a loss following a profit, then if you pay tax in that profit year, you can get that tax back. They're in effect averaging the two years to work out what the tax should have been on those profits. Now, trick though, even though we can get it for the June 19 year, 
and we're doing the June 20 year now, we can't actually claim it until we do the June 21 tax return. So they've snuck um, a little thing into the law that you'll actually claim a refundable offset, but you won't claim it until you lodge that June 21 tax return, which may not be until October 2021 or later. Um, it only applies to income tax losses. It doesn't apply to capital losses. Okay, you can you can you have the option to carry the loss back or you can carry the loss forward. It's up to you if you want to claim it or not. Uh, it, as I said, it's only companies and it's only for business losses. So all of these business measures only apply to businesses. Owning an asset and renting it is not necessarily a business. Um, renting out rental properties very rarely is a business. Usually businesses involve dealing with customers, having employees, usually having premises and things like that. Again, the, there's this $5 billion turnover test that's here again, so it's going to apply to just about every corporate in Australia, except for banks. We're not worried about banks and mining companies. It is limited to the tax you've paid. You're not going to get more tax back than you've paid. And if you've got a, and a company with a thing called a franking account, you can't get more back than that because if you've given out dividends with the tax credit ta credits for tax you've paid, they're not going to give you that back either because that's been distributed out to your shareholders. Um, there's an integrity rule. If you enter into a scheme deliberately to just get the offset, then they will uh, draw and quarter you. But you can use the instant asset write-off to create a loss in the 20, 21 or 22 years that can create a loss that you can carry back to the 19 year. Now they've come out and said that that's not one of the schemes that the integrity rule is aimed at because in order to claim the instant asset write-off, you've had to spend the money. Now, a situation where you could get caught out is if you never really paid the money and you tried to claim the instant asset write-off and then you tried to claim the lost carry-back, but you never actually ever paid for the asset, they might think that was a scheme. And I'm sure somebody might come up with a way to do that. It doesn't benefit people who aren't companies. And this is one of the, the cries about the law saying, why can't everybody have um, access to uh, lost carry-back? It's the policy, the old policy was the same, this policy is the same, that's what they've done. But if enough people make a noise about it, maybe they'll change it. It's common in many other overseas countries, but again, it's limited to companies. But we think it should be a permanent feature of the law. It shouldn't just be something they rolled out for COVID. It's only fair that if somebody pays tax and then has a loss, they should be able to recover that tax. Because um, if they make losses and they make tax profits, they're able to offset the losses against the profits. Why can't we do it the other way around? And that's the reason that we want it. There's an example. Um, you can run through that at your own pace, but you can see there that they're going to get their tax back or they're going to get it limited in scenario two because they didn't have enough tax credits. Um, but it's just showing you the mechanics of how it works when you've got tax paid in 19 and 20 and then you've got a loss in 2021 that you carry back, okay? The difference between the two is the amount because of the limit of, of income tax they've paid and of franking credits, right? So that um, you know what they can get back, okay? Other measure that they announced that's pretty important, and we're only just um, starting to understand this a bit because there's some important rules that and required to make this work and they only came out on the 2nd of November and they're only draft. So they're not actually um, finalised yet, but it does apply from the 6th of October or the 7th of October to the 6th of October 2021. So it's in play now, but um, they're not rushing on the rules because you won't actually be able to get the credits until um, at least February 2021. So for young people, uh, 16 to 29, who've been on Job Seeker for at least one month out of the two months prior to hiring, you'll get $200 per week for up to a year for the period that they're hired. For people 30 to 35, rate of $100 a week, up to it, so the maximum is 10400 per position. They've got to work at least 20 hours, okay? Um, and 
we claim it quarterly in arrears. So it's another one of these things where we don't we have to employ the people and pay them, and then we get the credit back. So we've got to be prepared to take it on. Now there is another measure that they've announced. It's, ta- it's not a tax measure, but there's an apprentice area as well, where they'll cover up to fifty percent of the wages up to a maximum there as well that people should be looking at but it's important if you've got capacity to get young people working that you can do that and as i said the regulations came out but they're not final yet but they are pretty much in line with the announcement that was made okay a couple of other quick measures in the budget was just um the way fbt works is that there's rules to say that if an employee would have got a deduction for something then it's not a fringe benefit. And the way our income tax law works is that if you want to claim deductions for studying to improve yourself to do, um, maybe open up another career or do something that's not quite the work you're doing, you, you wouldn't get a deduction for it. So if an employer retrained people who they were going to lay off to give them skills to get new jobs outside of their organisation, they'd have to pay fringe benefits tax on it, which I think is pretty yuck. Okay, but they've addressed that and they said, well, if you're going to help people get new jobs, um, we'll let you pay for those courses, get them upskilled so that they can leave your employment and go off and do other stuff, and we won't make you pay FBT on it. As a corollary to that, they're looking at changing the rules on tax deductions so that if you do any study that's related to a currently only deductible current income earning but a future income earning um, relationship, you'll be able to claim a deduction for that, but that's not out yet, but it's coming. But it's the same principle that's there. Um, Another one is for FBT, they'll let you use your records rather than have these declarations that the law technically says you have to have. So FBT record keeping will become easier. The calls um, at the start of the budget were get rid of FBT, it doesn't raise enough tax and it's just an overcomplicated burden, but they didn't listen to that, they just tinkered with it. Now, the next one is is not really business related. I just threw it in because of the way we have ageing populations and COVID's made us rethink how we look after people with all the aged care and the nursing homes and all the scares, um, is that they've been promoting for a while and you see the ads and everyone's doing it. We do granny flats in your backyard, have your parents live in your backyard and you, know, you look after them and everything's hunky-dory, it's a nice family thing. What nobody realised was there was a potential tax issue in there because um, the grandparents wanted security over the right to live in the backyard. So they would say, well, we want an agreement with the owner of the property, children, so that you can't kick us out if you have a fight with us and we're going to pay you money for that. So they might say, you know, sell their home and say, look, I'm going to give you inheritance early. It's 400000 I get to live in the backyard forever and a day, but it's my area. You don't really own it anymore. The people who owned it, um, the land would pay capital gains tax on it and they pay it on the 400000 They wouldn't get any discounts or anything like that. So there was a review where this was brought up and they said, well, that's not fair. So they introduced in the budget um, this exemption. It doesn't apply yet. It'll apply from, I think, 1 July 2021 that says that you can do that kind of arrangement and not have to pay tax on it. It is limited to certain people it, you can't do it and let somebody that's not family live in it um well sorry one july following the date of enabling legislation we have to wait for the law to come out but it'll save people um, doing that because what was people were doing is the grandparents were moving in and they didn't have an agreement because the people didn't want to pay tax so there was no security of right for the grandparents to live there and if they had a fight they get kicked out and they could lose their money and it was just all a bit of a mess. So it's designed to make it easier. So if you want to do that kind of thing, they're removing the tax burden for you. Okay, so that's the budget. So no questions coming through for the budget? I don't have any, no. no. Okay. Um, now we'll look at the extension to JobKeeper. So um, the extension to JobKeeper, little, it's a tweak on the original JobKeeper. So all of the considerations you had before, you still have. You still have your 30% drop in turnover tests. You just measure it differently and on different periods. You still have your same alternative tests, the same types of tests, but they're just different in application because they apply to different periods. 
So they extended the scheme to 28 March 2021, but they broke it into two periods. So we've got September to January, 3 January, and 4 January to 28 March. Everyone has to retest. Nobody gets a clean sail through. Now, they changed the testing period to quarterly and not monthly. They, it's based on actual turnover and not projected. Now, I had lots of clients and very, very big clients who, during COVID, um, and one of them was a, um, a publisher and school shut. And their business was schools. So they were quite rightly projected at the start of March that they were not for that month going to sell any books because schools were closed or maybe it was April. And so they, and they had to get a 50% drop in turnover because they're fairly large. So they projected that. Now, during, I think it was April, um, maybe it was May, but for whatever month they predicted, schools reopened. And what happened when schools reopened? they got overrun with business. Now, it actually turns out their turnover didn't drop at all in the month that they projected. But because they registered at the start of the month when schools were closed and it was reasonable to do that, they did have a review from the ATO because they looked at the figures and said, well, you made money, you didn't lose it. But they got through it and said, well, no, it was reasonable that you predicted that schools were closed. That's 90% of your business. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have um, made the money, so you could get JobKeeper to keep your people going. It was worth about $5 million, if I remember rightly, to them. Um, they won't be able to do that anymore. Okay? They're, it's actual. So you're comparing an historical period with a current period, and it's what's in your BAS. So it's, you, it's based on the method used in your business activity statement, um, and, and it's for the relevant quarter and it's the same basis. So you're comparing September 20 with September 19. That's it if you use the basic test. And if you're on a cash basis, you compare it with cash. If you're on accruals, you compare it with accruals. That's it. And if that's not 30% down, pretty much you don't qualify for the JobKeeper. But that's only for this period. Assuming something else goes wrong and maybe we go back into lockdown, we have a second period that you can retest. So they're not linked. So um, you didn't need, you can get JobKeeper in the first extension if you didn't get it up to the 27th of September. You can get JobKeeper from 4 January to 28 March if you didn't get it from September to January 2021 or from March to September. They're completely retested there. Um, and just because you got them in the early ones doesn't mean you get them in the later ones. Now, the payment tiers, so the current 1500 has now dropped to 1200 um, And then it'll drop to 1000 in the second extension period. And for the people under the hours test, it'll be 750 and 650 Now, it's up to employers to keep the records of what their employees did. Now, there are a few calculations that you've got to do because you've got multiple periods to test. Um, when JobKeeper originally started, everyone had to be employed as of the 1st of March. They've now changed the reference date to the 1st of July, but also kept the 1st of March. So if you qualified on the 1st of March, you still qualify. And if you now qualify on the 1st of July, you qualify for all JobKeepers. And that changed on the 3rd of August. Um, now, the wages got to be paid and then they'll pay you in arrears. But just like they did for the first JobKeeper, because people are getting used to the systems, and this only applies for the extension one, is that it, when the original JobKeeper happened, you had until the end of March to make the required fortnightly payments. And for this period, you had until the end of October to make the periods. But after October, the, from the period we're in now, JobKeeper fortnights, you've got to meet the wage condition every fortnight. There's no catching up over the month. If you don't make it for a fortnight, you don't get reimbursement for that, and if they review it, they'll claw it back. So we've got to be on top of making those top-ups and being aware of what we've got to pay now. If you didn't register for the first extension by the 31st of October, it's too late. Look at it for the next extension period. You're not ruled out of the next extension period. Okay, so some specific things to consider for the extension. It's actual turnover. So we have a client who, it's a, it's a quirk of fate. They're actually down by more than the 30%, but they operate on a cash basis. 
So in September 19, they had an average cash collection period. And then when COVID hit, their cash dried up and it dried up from March to June. But from July to September, all of the cash they were owed to 2020, all of the cash they were owed came rolling in. And it was March, April, May, June, July, all by September 20. So September 20, on a cash basis, was way above um, September 19 quarter. They don't get the extension, but they are, in fact, when you look at their business and the turnover down 37%, there is no, there is no um, concession in the rules. They just don't get it on that basic test. There's 20 hours per week to get the higher rate over the four, hour, four weeks of pay before 1 March or the four weeks of pay before 1 July 20. You get to work out both and you get to choose. Uh, you just pick which one suits you the most. Um, again, as I mentioned before, you can qualify for either or both of the extension periods regardless of another period. Still the same 50-30, 15% test, um, but there are some changes where there's bushfires and natural disaster. Um, still pay employees in advance and businesses have to keep the records and nominate the rate of pay based on those employment records. Now, there are alternative tests. Now, just, just before yes. you go into those, Darren, I've, I've got a question here that's come through. Um, it is along the lines of what happens if you're 25% down, and I presume we're talking turnover, um, in September, but it turns out you're 40% down in October when compared with the previous year. Um, I believe, obviously, our, our threshold is that being 30% down. Um, if I interpret this question, it's saying you missed out for the September quarter, um, you're at 25% down, but then you look forward and you're actually 40% down for October. Um, what I, I guess I can clarify is it's actually the quarter we're talking about. So under JobKeeper 2.0 or 2.1, we're actually talking about the full quarter. So to address that question, if you are down 40% in October, you still need to wait to see what October, November and December are like. So in other words, that 40%, if that continues for November and December, yes, you would, you would qualify for the next one. However, if it's just 40% for October um, and then your turnover rebounds, um, you won't be eligible. So it's quarterly and actual, and if you if you're at twenty nine point nine percent, you don't get it. You need to be a thirty percent decrease. It's a bright line test. Before there was there was scope that they wouldn't necessarily hold it back if it was twenty five percent because you could use estimates and stuff. Now it's bright line, and yes, it is quarters, and you compare the quarter to the quarter. The only saving grace could be that some of these alternative tests apply. There's a lot more detail than we've got time um, to go through tonight. Each one of them is its own little topic. But we found a number of clients that have failed that bright line test. Unfortunately, that other client, we couldn't get one of these other tests up, might be able to pass them. It's for new businesses. So businesses that don't have a comparison period in September 19 quarter can use that business started. Right? So from 1 July, after 1 July businesses, they might be able to use that alternate test. If they acquired a business or disposed of a business and it affected their turnover, they're not subject to comparing September 19 quarter to September 20 quarter, because obviously their circumstances are different. They've got a range of other tests. They've got a business restructure that changed the entity's turnover. There's a definition of restructure, but again, you're not comparing apples with apples, so they'll allow you to have another test. Um, we've got businesses that were ramping up before COVID, right? Um, they have another test. They don't have to compare September 19 to September 20. They can compare something else because obviously September 19 was in a growth period, right? And September 20 might be doing well. They need to look at what, how that works. Businesses affected by drought or natural disaster, obviously their figures are different. They might have been going really bad in September 19 and they might be doing the same in September 20 and they're still a struggling business and they haven't shown a decrease and it's because they're in drought and they're not anymore. Businesses that don't have regular turnover. So it's, it's not anything that's cyclical. It's something like a building and construction firm is the most common example where they might get busy and then they might not be busy. It's not as though they've got a, 
you know, a fruit picking season or something like that or a harvesting season, it's ones that are truly irregular. Um, sole trader or small partnership with sickness, injury or leave, they have a different test. And they've added another one, the business might have temporarily closed. So it's not fair to compare apples with apples because they closed, so they have another test that they can apply as well. Um, so um, we have new tests for JobKeeper. A lot of our clients are falling off. Um, one of the people we were talking to today, um, nearly all of her clients were on JobKeeper, now 50% are on JobKeeper. Others, it might be 10 or 20%. So we expect we, we're seeing a large drop off, but just because you don't meet the first extension doesn't mean you won't get the second extension. So the question you ask Greg about that person who's down in October, they may very well qualify for the second extension because their periods are down, so don't give up on it and they should stay in the system and stay connected. And just because you fail that first September 19 quarter, September quarter test, you still might be able to apply these alternative tests. They are a bit tricky. Um, they require a fair bit of analysis because there's lots of permutations, but it is important that you actually have a look and not just give up. Because as I said, a lot of our clients, when we work through it, they've actually qualified under these tests. So Darren, we had an example today of a client that um when they look back at their GST turnover um, last September quarter, um, if they were to use the accruals basis, um, they would have passed the test. Um, but when they use the cash basis, they failed the test. Um, so we have to go back to the quarter last year and see how they reported on their business activity statement. Was it cash or was it accruals? And you can't essentially change it. So if you use cash back then, you can't go and use accruals now just to, to pass the test. Um, and in addition, you can't go back and quickly amend the business activity statement you did back in September last year um, just to change your, I guess, the way you report your GST. Um, that's certainly going to raise eyebrows with the ATO. Well, the, the, uh, exactly right. The change won't apply until you notify them. So you're not notifying them the September 19 that you're changing your method, you're notifying them now and they won't let you go back and do it. So you can't change it. So you're stuck with what you did in September 19, unfortunately. And that's just the way, they're trying to make the rule simple, but by making the rule simple, they're catching people out that would have qualified with the flexible approach that they had before, but unfortunately, um, they're not doing that anymore. Um, just a, a point I'd like to raise is that um, when the job keeper was announced, um, we went through a period where people were assessing their turnover um, and a lot of businesses were impacted, especially for that first month. And so their turnover was well and truly down. But if you're fortunate enough to have revenue coming through the door, so you still are running your business, um, I wouldn't beat yourself up about not being able to, to pass this test of having revenue down by 30%, I'd be saying you're very fortunate. Let's look at ways to, to get the revenue back up to 100% and if not more. So it's not all about satisfying the, I guess, the 30% reduction for JobKeeper purposes. You've still got to run a, a profitable business and I guess that's now becoming more the focus for clients as we move forward and hopefully as we emerge from this COVID period that we're going through at the moment at the moment and the only reason they're surviving is JobKeeper and cash flow boost. They, if you take those numbers out of their profit and loss, they're not actually making money. And so the question is then, are they in fact viable going forward unless the revenue starts coming in and they start doing something? Because mm -hmm. at the moment, they're pretty much going backwards and without that eye in the future, they're gonna really struggle going forward. Yep. Exactly. All right, well, look, I, I don't have any um, further questions, but um, look, maybe we, we might pause for the moment and um, please, if you've got any questions, please send them through and we'll do our best to address those. I think we've got about five minutes left, so um, we might just pause for the moment.
nothing. I don't think we're, no, there's nothing further. We, you, you, your presentation must have been so comprehensive, Darren, no one's got anything left to ask. Or so. bore them into silence. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Darren and Greg. We really appreciate it. It's very generous and um, that was really informative and I know that um, you know, our small and medium-sized businesses in primary care would have really benefited from that information. So thank you to you as well for attending tonight and for that one person sending through a question. We always love your engagement and um, you know, we, we do have an evaluation poll on Slido. So on the right-hand side of your screen, um, if you click the little polls tab, you'll see that come up. Um, if you could just take a minute to fill that out. Um, yeah, we'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, that's all for this evening. Um, we do have lots of other education still coming up for the end of the year. So uh, do check out the PHN education page um, and we'll have the registration links there. But uh, once again, thank you to PKF for generously spending the time with us tonight. Um, and thank you for attending and we'll see you soon. Thanks, good night.